You can listen to The Professional Left wherever you get your podcasts on Netroots Radio or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for August 26th, 2022. It's not safe for work. Recorded live from the Cornfield Resistance, where we're celebrating Pat Ryan's victory thanks to the Blue Gal bump. It's the professional left with Drift Glass and Blue Gal. Hi, everybody. Hey, Blue Gal. I will not take credit for Pat Ryan full, winning in New York. Full credit. Don't take full <laughs> credit. <laughs> I, I sent a few postcards uh, to voters in his district. As did many other people. Sure. Inspired and, by you. Uh, yeah. mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't think so. No. I think you're giving me way too much credit. But it is very interesting that that was an upset in New York 19. Yes. Uh, due in in large part, I believe, to the work of women. Women working at Moms Demand Action. He's a gun sense candidate. Mm-hmm. Uh, women working at Postcards to Voters because he was one of the candidates that Postcards to Voters uh, focused on uh, mm-hmm. that special election. And uh, I just find it really interesting that here is this Democratic upset. This was not expected that he would win. Right. Uh, the anger of women on the Roe v. Wade loss of rights yep. was in his estimation as the candidate. Uh, very instrumental in getting him elected. Uh And so the righteous anger of women upset an election. And the media is going from, wow, wow, this was an upset, to five seconds later saying, well, special elections really don't count. I've heard that. It's just crazy. Yeah. Greg Dworkin on Twitter said, Mm -hmm. you know, how big is Pat Ryan's win in New York? Uh, Congressional District 19 special election. So big that pundits are switching today from bellwether, watch closely, all eyes, to uh, special elections don't really matter that much. Yeah. Yeah, because it, it's not in anyone's script. It's not that, the narrative. Right, uh, right. And uh, there was a post at Crooks and Liars yesterday, I believe, talking about how the media has a narrative for Ron DeSantis that they yes. are just sticking to. Mm-hmm. Like yep. Lou, even though he's a horrible person. Mm-hmm. Uh, Drift Glass, you had an idea for a silent auction. I did. I did. I, and we, we talk, tossed it back and forth. We decided that it it's a good sort of interim fundraising idea. So we're starting, <laughs> we're starting a silent auction, the winner of which will not have to have breakfast with Laura Loomer. So let the bidding begin. I had a tweet Tuesday night that said, last person off Twitter has to have breakfast with Laura Loomer tomorrow yeah, morning. <laughs> it's it's bad. She uh, well, and now she's declaring herself congresswoman from her district before the general election has happened. She's just, I'm it. I'm the congresswoman. That's it. Yeah, you know, watery tarts tossing <laughs> cutlery at a, from a lake is no way to select a congressperson, Laura <laughs> Loomer. <laughs> Especially freaking imaginary one. No, she got this is remember, this is a Republican primary. Yeah. Republican, yeah. These are Republican versus Republican. Correct. Nobody else running in this primary but Republicans. Right. And the minute she started to look like she was going to lose, and she did lose, she freaked out and started yelling about voter fraud, voter fraud, voter fraud. And Republicans really need to take this seriously. This is serious. And she's, you know, 80% um, crocodile tears that just come out on demand. And she was weeping and wailing and gnashing her teeth. And now she just decided, oh, nope, I won. And this is the logical endpoint of, you know, the entire 40-year history, 50-year history of the GOP. She is the illegitimate, very legitimate, clearly defined child of Newt Gingrich and Karl Rove and Frank Luntz and all the rest of them. This is where it was going to end up. And they have ended up here. And it's so lucrative. Oh, it's a fortune. There's a fortune to be made. Even today, there's a shit ton of money to be made just popping up on YouTube with your own little channel and telling them, you know, the secret's out and you can trust me because I know what's really going on. And, uh-huh. you know, and, if, and and Alex Jones proves at making how much a day? I know, 
eight hundred thousand thousand dollars in one day. In yeah. one day, that there is a staggering amount of money out there. We are a severely undertaxed country because there's a shit ton of money among stupid people out there who are willing to throw it at anyone who tells them what they want to hear. Um, and there's no money for people who tell them what they don't want to hear. <laughs> as we learned, as uh, as Brian Stelter learned, that career path is rapidly coming to a close because mm -hmm. this is the week that CNN uh, was taken over. Well, this happened a few weeks ago, taken over by uh, uh, a right-wing lunatic um, who appointed Joe Scarborough's former henchman as his president of CNN who promptly fired the one person on television who talks about media in a critical way. Yeah. So and that's Fox the in a critical way, yeah. specifically. Yeah. Yep. Anyway, <sighs> I believe you wanted to talk about Liz Cheney and our love affair with her. No, we don't have a love affair with Liz Cheney. No. We appreciate the dogged viciousness that she brings to the January 6th hearings. Uh, we appreciate that she's on the right side of democracy in that one instance, but a lot of people reminded uh, all of us, that she voted with Trump 93% of the time. Yeah, yeah, she did. And I appreciated Hal Sparks mentioning that the woman that won that primary in Wyoming mm -hmm. uh, is not going to vote any differently in Congress than Liz Cheney did. There is Absolutely no not. There is no end game difference mm -hmm. between the two in terms of House votes. Uh, it'll be more wackadoodle nut job proclamations on whatever media she can get on. Yeah. But, uh, and she's anti-democracy, which is a reason to vote against her. Right. But, it, but in terms of actual who, you know, and, and it'll be interesting to see if, you know, God forbid the Republicans do take that back the house, uh, which is looking every day, less and less likely. I got to yes. say, keep, nah. keep hustling. Keep doing those outreach to voters, not just hashtags on Twitter. Mm -hmm. That does not talk. You're talking to your friends on Twitter. You're talking to people who have already signed <laughs> on to, to listen to what you have to say. Well, OK, I'm not talking to my friends on Twitter. Um, <laughs> you don't get, have any friends on Twitter. I get, I get yelled at a lot on Twitter, <laughs> which, you know, I, I don't I don't go on Twitter to own the right because that's mm -hmm. kind of pointless. But I do. Yeah like to engage constructively with people who were like, say, popping up a third party scam, <laughs> um, which is transparently a third party scam. Well, I guess uh, what I'm trying to say is that getting back to the midterms and winning the house and yes. holding out of the house, uh, find a way to share your story and share your values with yes. people who are not already in agreement with you. Uh, or that are on the fence or aren't political junkies. And that's, that's really where we're looking to go yeah. is talk to people about how embarrassing this is, what they're do what the Republicans are doing is make it a referendum on Donald Trump. You know, Oh, look, this guy is wants to stop counting your vote. If your vote doesn't go the way he wants it to. And, and this, the this guy doesn't care whether you have clean drinking water or not. He's voted no on baby formula. And you know, this, there is, these are the kind of questions that make people think, oh, I really don't want to vote for that person. Well, there isn't any amount of frosting you can put on the Liz Cheney turd mm -mm. Uh, to make it appear anything other than the fact that she is a hardcore right wing, um, hard right, crazy right Republican who disagrees with her party on one single thing. Right. And there's no crystal ball in the universe that our never Trump friends can peer into and pretend that anything happened in Wyoming other than what Wyoming base voters voted for the person they wanted. Mm -hmm. And they wanted everything that Liz Cheney gave them all those years, yeah. plus uh, getting rid of fair elections and democracy. That's Correct. what they really, really want. And four fast facts about Liz Cheney is that last month she voted against women being able to leave a state to seek reproductive health access. She voted against a bill that would require reporting white supremacists in the U.S. military. Liz Cheney begged for Democrats to vote for her in Wyoming and then swore she would never, ever, ever, ever vote for a Democrat herself. And finally, Liz Cheney lies about Democrats murdering babies and calls us, you and me, Democrats, pure evil. 
Mm -hmm. So no, she's not a fucking ally. She yeah. never will be. She agrees with us on one thing. And the minute she gets a chance to put a knife in us, she will. And if but you, she if is a hero to the Never Trumpers trick class. Of course, she, she is their only hero. And I, they get very hero. upset. They get very <laughs> upset when you bring this stuff up to them because they have nobody else. And honestly, having monitored their, their transmissions, you know, for weeks on end, fully half of what they talk about on Never Trump podcast is how awesome Liz Cheney is. Yeah, you got one person in your entire party who did one thing well, and you were worshiping her and sneering at us for pointing out that this is where your party was going to go all along. So have fun with that. I'm uh, I'm going to get yelled at on Twitter a lot. Um, <laughs> now, here's a fun story. You know how much I love a fun story on Twitter, Blue Cow? Oh, sure. Because it unfolded from President Biden's student loan package, which we'll talk about in greater depth during the news. Suffice it to say, Biden did some good stuff this week. He for is forgiving a bunch of student loans. He for has already forgiven a whole bunch of student loans already. They're targeted, they're sensible, and so forth. Um, now, Purple Strategies is a, quote, corporate reputation strategy firm which is located in Washington, D.C. and my former home of Chicago, which alleges to be, quote, inspired by politics, partnering with clients around the world to anticipate, navigate, and compel change. So, you know, bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. Purple Strategies partner Rory Cooper decided to be fun to jump on Twitter to protest the terrible injustice of, quote, White House asking middle-class families to pay $20,000 to households earning a quarter million dollars which is how he frames Joe Biden's student loan forgiveness package. And then someone remembered that you could look up PPP loans online. And some enterprising soul looked up Purple Strategies PPP loan forgiveness status. And wouldn't you know it, Purple Strategies was, was forgiven $1,645,900 worth of loans in 2020 and another $1,645,000 $873 in 2021, which uh, I think Keith Olbermann stole this line from me uh, this morning. It looks like Purple Strategies is going to need a really good corporate reputation strategy firm. Because, <laughs> yeah. man, Rory decided to step way out on that limb. But the story doesn't end there, does it, Blue Gal? No, it doesn't. Uh, Mehmet Oz is also against student loan cancellation, but has had nearly 360000 of his own PPP loans forgiven along with nearly every other Republican whining about this. Now, the editor of the right-wing husk that Newsweek has become, her name is Batya Ungar Sargon, also has a real beef with student loan forgiveness and decided also to hop on social media to bitch about it. Quote, I just don't know how these people making $100,000 a year look people in the face who, char who change seniors' bedpans for a living and drive a truck or work the railroad, or stock grocery shelves, or deliver their Amazon packages, and say, you, yes, you, give me $10,000. I just don't get it. And you guessed correctly, if you guessed that the right-wing Newsweek husk received a PPP loan forgiveness for $659,800 to get through the tough times. And that's not the amount they were forgiven for. They were forgiven for $666,300. Uh, $666,031 because we taxpayers decided that Newsweek shouldn't have to pay back any interest that accrued on that loan during that period. I'd also like to add in here Steve Crowder, the profoundly unfunny conservative quote unquote comedian who has 2 million followers on Twitter and runs a thing called Louder with Crowder on YouTube. Steve-O also sneers at student loan forgiveness and was also forgiven two PPP loans of his own one for $70,445 and one for $71,208. And let me say, I don't have a problem with forgiving PPP loans. I really think it's fine, even mm -hmm. for conservatives. Those loans were made so that these companies, and even Steve Crowder, who is a company, uh, could meet payroll. Right. And they have people working for them as sound engineers and uh, whatever else secretaries, people who are not millionaires working for them. Uh, you know, Sean Hannity is another one who whined about this. Like, my employees don't make 
$125,000. Well, why aren't you paying your employees <laughs> at Fox a decent wage in New York City while you work from home on Long Island? Honestly. Uh, but these PPP loans mostly went to pay average working people so that they wouldn't have an unemployment crisis during right. COVID. Their, their companies wouldn't crash. Their their homes right. wouldn't be repossessed. The economy wouldn't come to a screeching halt and, and fall down under and a have plague. serious hunger and, you know, actual decimation of people's lives. Well, as, as so, President Joe Biden reminded everyone yesterday during his speech, yeah. remember a year and a half ago when people in nice cars were lined up for miles for a box of food? Right. That's right. what we were dealing with, which is yep. weirdly being memory hold by these yep. rich white assholes who yep. don't want to forgive student loans. Right. Right. Um, and I paid off my student loans to class. I had $29,500 in student loans when I graduated in 1988 from graduate school. Yep. And I paid them. It, it took me until my 30s, mid 30s to pay them off. And uh, I went without a car for years. And I lived in Boston. I didn't need a car. But, you know, that student loan payment was a car payment that I, did, I couldn't make because I was paying off my loans. And I have no problem with this. This is fairness. This is because Pell Grants did not keep up with the rate of educational inflation. Exactly. And, and Biden and, said that as well in his speech yesterday. And the price of state tuition, in-state tuition in community colleges has skyrocketed. Yeah, state I'm schools. A, yeah. I'm a big believer in in state schools and community colleges. And the mm -hmm. cost of tuition uh, at those institutions has gone up and up and up and up. Uh, textbooks are insane. I mean, we have three young people in our family who are all in college at the same time. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know if our listeners know this, but the professional left LLC is a company. <laughs> we actually have a company. Yes. And we do. would you like to know how much we got in PPP loans? Zero. We got nothing. Zero. <laughs> nothing. Nada. And we have, we have two people on our payroll. <laughs> but you know, if we if we would have gone the uh, Steve Crowder route, oh yeah. Um, yeah, we could have pulled in quite a bit of money. We wouldn't be asking you how for anything. How much did he get? How much? Uh, how much? Seventy thousand plus one year. Seventy thousand plus the next year, <clears throat> which is well, staggering to me. That yeah. Okay. Well, that's cool. Um, and we just stayed up and running and kept doing our jobs because we work from home and, you know, this is yeah. what we do. Considered it a blessing them. to be able to continue to do it, right? Exactly. Exactly. And and we provided what we think is a service during good times and bad. Right. Um, and we have kids in college. And so, you know, you should come to us, media, and ask us as a professional media company – who didn't apply for PPP loans, who has three kids in college. <laughs> we don't, we don't what, take handouts from the government. <laughs> what, what we think about Joe Biden's plan. We yeah. love that plan. We think yeah. it's fucking terrific. So come talk to us. When you're done with the Trump voters down the street at the diner, drop yep. by our place and ask our opinion because we'll give you the real deal. And particularly no one was expecting the doubling the forgiveness if you were a Pell Grant recipient because no. that is economic justice. If you're poor enough to have received a Pell Grant uh, and Pell Grants went to nothing, you know, in the yep. 90s and 2000s and 2010s, yep. they didn't keep up with the cost of education at all. And Congress never passed, you know, inflation indexing for Pell Grants like they did for Social Security. Mm -hmm. I noticed there's a lot of Social Security recipients bitching about this on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, your your Social Security check is going to go up 9% in January. Pell Grants don't do that. Um, so, yeah, it it we're getting all that mythology about, you know, the deserving poor versus the undeserving poor. And it's just bullshit. Um, speaking of education, let me take this opportunity to recommend that everybody visit Tex Betsy. And it's B-E-T-S-Y. Tex, as in Texas. Tex Betsy on Twitter. Um, she is an educator. She uh, teaches, uh, I believe, ESL mostly. I think um, you're right. And uh, she's an amazing person. She has been teaching in Texas for many, many years. She has moved to New Jersey to be closer to family and uh, is teaching again in New Jersey this year. And she needs our help uh, buying school supplies. Uh, she has a list at Amazon that she is trying to uh, clear the list <clears throat> of things that she needs for her classroom. 
And so uh, she's a personal face-to-face friend of the pod, and she we is. want to promote her getting what she needs to start her classroom. Well, um, and to tell the truth, she moved to New Jersey so she could personally vote against Mehmet Oz. And then she discovered, <laughs> oh, much to her surprise, <laughs> he had fled the state um, <laughs> to run in some other state where he doesn't live. So, yeah. sorry, Tex yeah. Betsy. You know how it goes. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh we want to uh, cheer a media outlet. Yes, we as do. As well as all of the dissing of media outlets that do bad things. Uh, we really appreciated what the Cleveland Plain Dealer newspaper did this week. Their editors covered the J.D. Vance, uh, Ron DeSantis rally this yeah. way. Mm-hmm. Quote, We reject the free speech trampling rules set by J.D. Vance and Ron DeSantis for covering their rally. The statement was followed with a black and white square with a black X (laughs) through it. And we're done. We're not going to promote this. Uh, Good for them. Yeah, that's exactly what you should do. That's exactly how you should cover these people. Well, and if you weren't going to cover it like, you know, if you weren't just going to air our talking points, then... We don't want you to cover our thing. Good. We won't cover it then. We'll cover the fact you don't want us to cover what you're talking yeah, about. Right, right. Yeah. That's fair. That's that's journalism. Sure. Mm-hmm. You know, that undid uh, Richie Daly in his first run for mayor. Every other paper reported what he thought he said and what he <laughs> intended to say. And the reader get an actual transcript of Richie Daly locked in a death battle with the English language. <laughs> And like, oh shit, this guy's this guy's a moron. And that was one of the things that allowed Harold Washington to sort of sail up the middle and win. Yeah. But it, it was, and and the Daily family, the Daily Dynasty was furious. How dare you report what the words that what came he out of my mouth said instead yeah. of what the people we hired to write did speeches told him to say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it was fun times, and I do miss Harold Washington every day. Charlie Sykes Driftglass has had quite yes. a week. <clears throat> Charlie Sykes, you know, I have been saving up my bulwark uh, credit with my wife so I can talk about yeah, it a little he bit. Has. You know? I've been I've been trying been on a fast, I've been trying to be real good. Um Charlie Sykes, you probably know because he shows up on MSNBC about as often as the MSNBC logo shows up on MSNBC. He is on there every goddamn day. And this week and last week, but this week mostly, um, he had on an author who has a book. Um That's all about the 30-year history. The title of the book is Partisans, the Conservative Revolutionaries Who Remade American Politics in the 1990s. And that's when my breath went, oh, my God. Uh, Charlie Sykes has entered the undiscovered country. (laughs) He has gone into the before time. And I guess it can no longer be sort of pretended away. There just are too many books and too many articles and too many people talking about Newt Gingrich and Rush Limbaugh and the history of right-wing radio and blah, blah, blah for them to keep pretending it never happened. So instead, Charlie Sykes has invited this author and other another author, Dana Milbank, on his show, where he sits with kind of wide-eyed, childlike wonder and pretends he never knew about any of this stuff at all. Really? There was a guy named Newt Gingrich and he was a mean guy? Really? There was it's not quite that bad, but it's pretty much that bad. And it it is just hilarious to me that Charlie Sykes, who is a 30-year conservative radio veteran from Wisconsin, who knew Newt Gingrich, who had Newt Gingrich on his show, Mm -hmm. and who was a Wisconsin Republican power broker because he had a radio talk show um, that was modeled on Rush Limbaugh's show. And he's just like, wow, I never even realized any of this stuff. And this woman (laughs) is giving – and this woman is like reading our blogs, Blue Gal. She talks about – um, Newt Gingrich and the majority maker thing he got and what happened with Rush Limbaugh and all the imitators and the Rush rooms, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the story about what really happened was in 1992 when George H.W. Bush needed to suck up to somebody to get him over the Pat Buchanan hump. And he turned to Roger Ailes, who was Rush Limbaugh's TV producer and on and on and on. And I just stopped during this thing going, you know, this woman, this woman author named Hemmer, um, you ha- says you have advisors to Bush saying you have to sound more like Rush Limbaugh to George H.W. Bush. 
And then you have a leader in the Republican Congress named Newt Gingrich. And I just stopped and said, yes, we know. We know. We fucking well know. We all know this. Why are you talking to Charlie Sykes as if he doesn't know this stuff? I don't want to frighten you, but one of those Limbaugh imitating wingnut message amplifier people is sitting right across from you. Why don't you ask him about his experience? And Charlie Sykes just kept brushing past it. He said, yeah, I, I knew about that stuff. Yeah, I was sort of involved in that. But let's talk about what really happened. Let's talk about the future. Let's talk about how we got here. And every time the conversation veers slightly into, you know, what happened during the period between 1992 and yesterday, he just backs away from it, walks away from it. And then finally, he said, you know, that was a long time ago. I'm sure there were some turning points. But I do want to take a quick digression. So let's run the tape forward to where we are now. And he then, and she's really clear about this. In her book, she says, none of it had happened behind the scenes. Yeah. None of it was hidden. It was all out there in plain sight. I swear to God, it's straight out of our blogs, little gal. Mm -hmm. She's I saying, look, you. this happened out in the open. This is There's no mystery about this. And Charlie Sykes says, and I quote, I'm going to put myself in that category that I did not fully understand that transformation. How deep it ran. I mean, look, we all saw Pat Buchanan and we knew those people were out there. We never thought, we, me, didn't think that it would ever become dominant. But they saw something that a lot of Republicans did not see, right? And then he throws it back to her. Mm -hmm. And I'm just looking at this, looking at my microphone, looking at, looking at the speaker going, holy Jesus. Because all of it came down to, I didn't never know nothing I didn't know what was going on, et cetera. Mm -hmm. well, there's two, and, and there's this whole rationale about how, you know, liberal media was biased, you know, terribly, terribly, terribly biased. And so conservatives had to have an alternative. So maybe liberals are kind of responsible for the fact that, you know, we went nuts and started lying to everybody. And I keep hearing that complaint that the conservatives had no choice because the bad old days, everything was so biased. And I never hear any actual concrete system-wide examples of that terrible bias. So I ask myself, is he talking about how Lyndon Johnson sailed to victory in his second term because the liberal media would not talk about Vietnam or protests? It was the horrible injustice that was done to Nixon by those nasty Washington Post reporters? Was it the fuss liberals made over that innocent misunderstanding like Iran-Contra? Was it how liberals rushed to blame conservative media paranoia for the Oklahoma federal building bombing just because the bombers were quoting verbatim from right-wing media propaganda? Was it how Edward R. Murrow ended every broadcast with death to the West? <laughs> or did the breaking point come when Walter Cronkite changed his name to Walter Cronick and fired up a doobie on the air? Show me examples of how horribly biased liberal media the liberal media was. And I'll listen to something you have to say. But I don't see anything other than a whole bunch of hard right-wing Archie Bunker types furious that their crazy shit isn't being treated respectfully by well, professionals in the media you're forgetting, you're forgetting the most important quote about bias in the past 50 years. Yes. Which is truth has a well-known liberal bias. It does. Stephen and Colbert at the White House Correspondents' Dinner while George W. Bush sat right there taking it. And, and then... Charlie Sykes kind of winds up with, also, I think that Spiro Agnew is underappreciated in terms of historic <laughs> role. He really was one of the first figures that created the language, that voice, that pugilistic approach. Da, 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 da. And I said, now we're done. Okay, now we're yeah. done. And all I'm left with is this question, which is a question I will never get an answer to because nobody's going to tell me the truth about it. And we, you and I both know the truth. Mm -hmm. Why does Charlie Sykes have a job at MSNBC? Oh, oh I think we know. Specifically, why does Charlie Sykes have an opinion-having job? Yep. Specifically, a political opinion-having job. Because his alibi for his 30 years on the air as a power broker and right-wing radio host in the model of Rush Limbaugh is that he never had the slightest fucking clue what was really going on right in front of him, in mm -hmm. plain sight, in his own party. And he just confesses to this abject, decades-long ignorance of the one and only subject for which he was hired for his special insider thoughts. So somehow he managed to almost immediately transition from the rubble of his radio career to becoming a guy on MSNBC who every day still pretends to be possessed of special insights 
into the minds of Republican base voters and into the minds and secret desires of independents and into the hidden and secret agendas of dirty liberal commies like me. So I'm delighted to hear from anyone from MSNBC who can explain to me how a person whose top line resume uh, sentence is, I don't know anything about the Republican Party and never did, even though I was running it and in it and power broking it for 30 years, gets a fucking job anywhere having an opinion about anything. And that's my rant for the day. That's his rant. Uh, The reason Charlie Sykes has a job on MSNBC is because MSNBC is a business. And the business, their business is to sell pharmaceutical ads between 12-minute Nicole Wallace segments. I know. So I know. that's what it is. Okay. I'm aware of that. Yes. And everyone should who listens to this podcast should be aware of that <laughs> already. Okay. So uh, Drift Glass wrote this up for me, but this is a who said it. Uh, Challenge. Riddle. Riddle for the day. Uh-huh. Quote, why do Republicans, plural, uh, senators, Republican senators, allow a broken down hack politician Mitch McConnell to openly disparage hardworking Republican candidates for the United States Senate. This is such an affront to honor and to leadership. He should spend more time and money helping them get elected and less time helping his crazy wife and family get rich on China. Ooh, man, that sounds like something and that uh, it's I'm Donald guessing. Trump. It's got to be Donald right? Trump. <laughs> it's Donald Trump. And but the thing is, the thing is, Drift Glass, and this I'm taking this straight from Steve M's blog at No More Mr. Nice Guy. Uh-huh. Uh he has a post up today um noting that an idea for another Democratic rat fuck, which is to capitalize on this feud that Donald Trump has started with Mitch McConnell and Mrs. Mitch McConnell. Uh-huh. His his um, his transportation secretary. His, tra- his own transportation oh, secretary, sec- yeah. right, who resigned on January 7th, by the way. She was on board until January 6th. Uh, he, McConnell is doing what Trump asks for in this truth social message. A cash-rich super PAC linked to Mitch McConnell will spend $156 million after Labor Day across eight states to boost Republican Senate candidates. So he's doing what Trump said. Yeah, you know, yes, he use is. your money to help the Republican Party. McConnell is doing that. So what Steve M suggests is, and I'm reading from Steve M's blog, in each of the states where McConnell's super PAC is spending, Democrats should run ads targeted at GOP voters, especially online, that show McConnell's candidate next to Mitch McConnell. Or better yet, next to Mitch McConnell and his wife, accompanied by, in huge letters, the words endorsed by Mitch McConnell. Democrats wouldn't be saying anything low or underhanded about these candidates. They'd just be stating a fact. Mm -hmm. And while including Elaine Cho in the ad opens up Democrats to charges of racism, I don't think there's a need to say anything negative about her or make her look sinister. Just an ordinary photo of McConnell and Chow. That's it. Mm-hmm. Mitch McConnell is widely disliked in Trump world, especially. Yep. Uh, according to Real Clear Politics average, he's at 25.8% favorable, 57% unfavorable nationwide. In the most recent poll that included a question about him, McConnell had a 20% favorable rating and a 60% unfavorable rating. And among conservatives, he's at 35, 49. Put him in ads, 35 positive, 49 negative, put him in ads and make Republicans have to pick a side between Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump. Well, Brugal, those those are just numbers. Numbers don't count for nothing. (laughs) Um, You might remember that uh, there was a- I just want to add one one more sentence that Steve M said. Republicans have been putting Nancy Pelosi in ads, in attack ads for years. Oh, yeah. So return the favor. It's time to return the favor. I yeah. was getting bug-eyed Nancy, crazy Nancy stuff yep. from conservatives yep. before Barack Obama was nominated. Absolutely. I mean, yep. in, th- she has been, they find women they hate and they demonize them. Women and they especially. Demonize them. Yep. And, yep. And, that, and that's just money in the bank because they don't need to redo that. They just need to press the button in the conservative brain and out comes, oh, that's right. Nancy Pelosi is hateful, awful, and she does terrible things. Can't really think of what. They but can't let terrible. go of Hillary on Fox. They're still no. saying, oh, you know, Hillary Clinton wants to be president so bad. Well, and for what? you, budding, 
<laughs> for you, for you buddy, budding videographers out there, remember there's a Mitch McConnell blank commercial out there. <laughs> That's right. The camera just panning across his office, and he has that big, terrifying <laughs> turtle demon <laughs> smile face. And it's, it's, you know, you can throw anything you want on there, anything you want. It's, it's public domain. Um, so go do that, and then let us know. By the way, um, this is not in our notes, but I do appreciate this. Did we mention this last week? I think we did. Um, the gentleman who did the uh, um, Biden video. Yeah, I can't remember when that went out, but he, we did not mention the nice thing he said about you. No, it was uh, uh, just blew me away. Just absolutely blew me away. Yeah, it was uh, um, the guy who made the video of the um, dancing weapon right? of choice. Weapon the of Joe choice Biden dancing. weapon of choice video, which was just amazing and wonderful and went viral and everywhere. Um, dropped the note to my wife. Yep. And he said that uh, it was because of reading your blog, Drift Glass, for all those yeah. years that inspired him to do the work that he does today. Yep. I, I just about fell over. I got to tell I, you. Well, you couldn't fall over because you were in bed and I woke you up to read That's true. it to you. Wake up. <laughs> wake up. I got to read this tweet to you. This is so nice. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. By the way, wake up. I've got to read this tweet to you is pretty much every day in our house. So <laughs> It is. One of us is waking the other one up to I, read a tweet. I mean, wake up. Or something. <laughs> Here's a cartoon of the New Yorker. It's hilarious. Wake up and read this. Yeah. Honey, yeah. can I read this this paragraph to you from a 1938 story by Fritz Leiber? Um, can I read you some of Ayn Rand's unpublished manuscripts? No, you may not. No, no. <laughs> Go back to sleep. Um, speaking of Ayn Rand's unpublished manuscripts. <laughs> um, really? Must you drift glass? A, a character who might well have stepped out of a first draft of Atlas Shrugged as oh, a smarmy yeah. right-wing asshole is a guy named Noah Rothman. He is the smuggest asshole on television. He, he is. really he is. is. He's a yeah. giant smug asshole. Uh, you might confuse him with uh, uh, Bill Crystal's idiot son-in-law because he they're, they're, from, they're from the same mold. They're privileged. They're real white. They get lots of time in the media. They have no business being there, and they're all over the place, and they're there for reasons that no one can explain to me and, and never will. So- Noah Rothman uh, was on Joe Walsh's podcast, which I also listened to. And I'm not going to give you the exhaustive rundown that I just gave you for Charlie Sykes' podcast. But I did learn some things about Noah Rothman. I learned that he only does what he does for money. He oh. doesn't He doesn't want to be public figure. He says, I just got to keep, you know, body and soul together. Got to keep a roof over my head. So all the, the punchy, punchy stuff I write, I do that for money. You know, I, 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 I fuck with liberals for money. That's what, okay. I, get, that's what I get paid to. Number one. Uh, number two, he, if he were in anything other than a ice blue state, he would vote for people like J.D. Vance in a heartbeat because he thinks gridlocking Congress and screwing Democrats is the most important thing you can possibly do because Democrats are as bad or worse than Donald Trump. Number three, he had his ass saved during the great Trump purge mm -hmm. of conservative media by guess who? MSNBC. Yep. MSNBC decided to reach into the dumpster of Republicans who got chased out of their media jobs and pluck out Noah fucking Rothman and give him a job on MSNBC where he proudly says, basically, I spent all of my time shitting on progressives because progressives are awful. Democrats are terrible. And I would never, ever, 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 ever vote for Democrats. So, hey, You've let's a give this a very seat on Morning Joe. I know yeah. that. Yeah. Oh, repeatedly. So MSNBC... You can thank MSNBC and Joe Scarborough for the fact that Noah Rothman still exists in the media universe because by the laws of the marketplace, he should have been swept out once Trump was swept into power. But your liberal media decided this guy, among all other people, needed a safe place and a steady paycheck, and they put him on the air specifically, specifically to shit all over people like you and me, which well, he loves doing. Because he shows up on time, mm -hmm. sober. I mean, this is... This was my explanation for why George Conway is on television. Yeah. Shows up sober, speaks in sound bites, shuts up when it's time to go to a hard break. And it doesn't matter what he says to anyone upstairs as long as the ads show up on time. Well, here's the thing. And he doesn't that. offend anybody by actually spouting liberal politics. That's you know? the thing. He, yeah. he, I don't, I don't know or care what executives at MSNBC watch or don't watch or pay attention to. Mm -hmm. But of all the people you could pluck out of the universe who can actually show up to work on time and sober and say yeah, things right. in short sentences, they picked the smarmiest, assholiest, most right-wing D-bag 
during the height of the Trump administration to come on the yeah. air and shit on liberals and shit on yeah. Democrats. Yeah. And that is a decision. That's not an accident. Yeah. They picked this guy and they picked yeah. this guy because he pisses off people like you and me. Yep. And yeah. that's, there are lots of people out there who didn't get PPP loans. No. Whether they're actually <laughs> yeah. PPP loans or PPP loans from MSNBC to save your career. Yeah. And who yeah. struggled and 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 fought and survived or didn't survive. This guy has been gliding through his life on a cloud <laughs> of privilege, and he yep. lets you know it. And he lets you know that yep. while Trump and the Republican Party are beneath me and they're small and they're petty and they're silly and stupid, Democrats are just as bad. And I'd like you to pay me a lot of money to go on the television and say that. And MSNBC yeah. said, sure, that's what we need during the height of Trumpism. Some asshole like you insulting Democrats when Democrats are already down and terrified. Yep. Anyway. Yep. I want to talk for a second about a segment on Ali Velshi's weekend show mm -hmm. where he had Frank Luntz and a Republican congressman come on and talk about both sides and getting along and being a polite to one another and listening to the other side and both sides and how can we come together and understand each other. And the Republican congressman kept bringing up in between all of his cl claims and desires for problem solving. He kept bringing up the border. <laughs> right. <clears throat> As if that's a thing. You mean the border between New Jersey and Pennsylvania? Yeah, or? that one. Oh, that yeah. one that, that immigrant mem Oz crosses all the time. Right. Yeah, uh, no, not that one. And Frank Luntz being there in particular. Mm -hmm. and, and believe me, when it came up against a hard break, Franklin's was ready to say something. He shut up right away because he knows time to go to commercial. My job is to shut up. Uh, Frank Luntz, I'm just going to remember one thing about Frank Luntz. He organized the caucus room conspiracy. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. He organized it. He had Newt Gingrich and Mitch McConnell, House Speaker Paul Ryan. All these guys met at the caucus room steakhouse in, in Washington and came up with a plan right around the time of Barack Obama's inauguration, that they were going to block everything he did. Yes. And that that was their strategy, mm -hmm. governing strategy of the party, was to block everything. And they are still doing it. To, They're to blocking see. baby formula. They're blocking clean water. They're blocking help for students. They're every, it's just vote no on everything. Mm-hmm. And so what you have now in this party is an increasing number every two years of grifters who are not there about policy, who are there to grift money from the rubes and vote no. And that's their job. It's not yeah. to introduce a bill, make anybody's lives better, name a post office. It is to vote no and get money. And, and own the libs. And own the libs. It's well, that's, the libs. Part of, that's part of the get money part. That, yeah. that is what they're selling is owning libs that you get money for that. And you put that in your super PAC and you can spend it on a $92,000 SUV like Marjorie Taylor Greene did. And the, um, for those of you who don't quite remember when Barack Obama was elected, the country was going through the worst economic collapse in 70 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. There was a massive health care crisis with millions, tens of millions of Americans who had no health insurance were going Thrown bankrupt off their every insurance because they'd lost their jobs. Right. And the manufacturing industry was on the verge of collapse, complete collapse. The auto industry was on the verge of complete collapse. It was a complete fucking mess. And Barack Obama arrived, rolled up his sleeves and said, okay, we've got to start fixing some stuff. And into the middle of this crisis comes Frank Luntz and the leadership of the GOP who said, let's pour sand in every gas tank. Let's right. jam up every gear. Let's stop this guy no matter what. Let's block everything, filibuster everything. We're going to filibuster our own bills right. just to make sure Barack Obama gets nothing. And they got no a lot of successes. help. No successes. No successes. And they got right. help from people like Joe Lieberman. Right. Who was perfectly yeah. willing to stab Barack Obama in the back to make sure that the public option never was added to the Affordable Care Act. So they ran on obstructing and stopping everything Barack Obama tried to do and then ran on Barack Obama being a tyrant because the only two left to him were executive orders. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, mm -hmm. the rest of the party was busy organizing the fake Tea Party. Right. Who were suddenly all these independents who'd never heard of George Bush, but who hated <laughs> Barack Obama and yeah. hated the deficit and hated government spending and hated liberals. 
And they started flooding into town halls everywhere, screaming about the goddamn communist plan to take over our healthcare system and murder my grandma. That was the Republican Party under the, the leadership of people like Frank Luntz. And don't, and Frank and Luntz. Please I was go just going to fr- say that Glenn Beck got paid a million dollars. He did. By Dick did. Army to promote that on his radio show. Sean Hannity and other Fox News personalities showed up at Tea Party rallies. They did. On, on a day. On like tax day. Tax, tax day. Yeah, on day, tax day. Yeah. Coast to coast. Coast to coast. And it was, a, it was a wall-to-wall coverage. And Frank Luntz now has a contract with MSNBC. Mm-hmm. To talk Come about on and talk both about sides. both sides. Isn't it and, a shame how both sides. And comedy and getting mm-hmm. along. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Because Frank Luntz shows up, not drunk, and says what they want him to say. That's right. And knows to when to shut up when commercials are coming. Drew Class, how's the Tesseract party going? It's going great, Blue Gal. Next. <laughs> it's going great. I'm having actual fun doing this because, you know... <laughs> The, the, see, the other third-party grifts that I have laughed at and mocked and, and stomped on, including um, party number three, the David Brooks uh, McCain-Lieberman party. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and I've uh, actually had like a platform or an idea or something. There was a little something they could hang on to, which is all bullshit, but it was something. The Tesseract party uh, has the advantage of going toe-to-toe with a forward party, which stands for nothing. It is a completely empty vessel that says, we're going to change some rules of election and that's what we're running on. And like, okay, how do you get elected to do that unless you have policies that people vote on in elections? And of course, Andrew Yang is completely silent on the subject of any of this stuff. It's this, give us the money now, year two, five, seven years from now, we'll tell you what we think about stuff once we've decided what we think. And there's a lot of children out there who believe this and want to believe it. Not Believe me, I understand that. I thought Ronald Reagan is too right and Jimmy Carter's too, uh, too conservative, so I'm voting for John Anderson. So I understand the impulse when you're not quite out of puberty yet to believe in miracle cures and instant answers. But there's always out there some, some Fagan or some, some artful dodger like Andrew Yang to take advantage of those kids and say, yeah, here, all we need to do is change a couple of rules. We'll have a new party. It'll be great. Now just give me your money and your time and your energy. And um, one of the things I've done this week, just for fun, is I've started looking into a brief history of third parties, just writing about them. I wrote about uh, the party number three, the 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 part, the actual Lieberman party in uh, in Connecticut. Which Joe Lieberman might as well have been Andrew Yang. He lost an election. He was pissed about it. So he invented a new political party that he could run in. And if you look at the Lieberman party, it's pretty much the forward party. It's a centrist party where both sides can come in and vote for Joe Lieberman. And it was, you know, 70% Republicans coming in and voting for Joe Lieberman. Um, also the most successful third party in American history. And I went through all the things they believe. They believe in centering citizen control of institutions and they believe that both parties, the, the national Republicans and the national Democrats are the problem. Not the good people, not the good independents and good Republicans and good Democrats uh, who vote for these people. They're just throwing their votes away. It's the system, man. It's the system that's keeping you from running your government. And we're not going to listen to the system anymore. We're going to have a brand new third party. And that party was the American Independence Party that nominated George Wallace for president in 1968. Because the bullshit you use to build a third party out of chumps and con men never fucking changes. Mm-hmm. But again, Wallace at least had segregation going for him. <laughs> he at least had <laughs> busing as an issue. Was he for it? He he yeah. he, he, he took a stand. It was a he racist did. stand. Oh, it was it was a monstrously evil yeah. stand. But he believed in it, and he did very well. He got more votes and electoral votes than any third party in modern history. Let me tell you something. My ex-husband was at one time president of the ACLU of Alabama. Uh-huh. And he argued in the year 2000 that if you put equal rights to the ballot box to a vote in Alabama, mm-hmm. it would lose. Yeah, I have no doubt. I have no doubt. If you put interracial marriage on the ballot in Alabama, it would lose. And so we don't vote for rights. That was always the argument at the ACLU. Rights aren't something that we allow one group of people to vote on <laughs> for another away. group of people. Yeah. Uh, and, but it's so. it's interesting to me because the language of building a third party scam always has to be mm-hmm. both sides are bad. It's not dimes with the difference. We're the third way. Yeah. And here's the yeah. thing we're going to do. 
And the thing we're going to do is getting more and more ridiculous. The, the mm-hmm. more clear it becomes, there are fascists and there are the non-fascists. And it's this bizarro attempt. I don't want to offend anyone. Um, so everyone's welcome in the party. Um, we're going to have a huge, passionate party full of true believers. Like, yeah, there's a word for that. And the word is partisan. Except partisanship is what you hate and deplore and blame everyone else for. And it's this mishmash of double talk and and uh, mixed signals and terms that don't mean anything and airy promises of future greatness, all combined with a very aggressive fundraising effort. And so I'm having a fine time just sitting on Twitter and sitting on social media and tracking these people and dropping them a, a, a proposed anthem every now and then or some new graphics for their cause or whatever. But it is refreshing, at least, to find someone who can, who's who's out and out scamming people, who's trying to cover it up, who's trying to hide it. The right wing is no longer attempting to be anything other than an American fascist party. There's no point in trying to trick them or con them or or scare them or appeal to their conscience. They don't have a conscience. They are fascists. Stop trying to reason with them. But these people in the middle, they keep trying to find some tricky language that's going to let you believe they have the answers. And their tricky language always screws them up because it always ends up sounding dumb or contradictory or clearly just a, uh, a way for Andrew Yang to raise money. Anyway, it's going great, Blue Gal. Thanks for asking. We got to talk a minute for about Rick Scott's Twitter account where Rick Scott <laughs> uh, bitched about Joe Biden vacationing at his home, by the way, in Delaware, uh, while Rick Scott was vacationing in Italy on a luxury yacht. Please be reminded that Rick Scott was also found guilty of the largest Medicare fraud in U.S. history, for which his hospital was forced to pay a $1.6 billion fine. Uh, Rick Scott is also now uh, in charge of the National Republican Senatorial Committee, which is nearly broke. (laughs) And uh, other Republicans are demanding that Rick Scott be investigated and the National Republican Senatorial Committee be audited. So uh, what a good week for Rick Scott. Yeah, it's just perfect. And, you know, I just I can't help but laugh because I, I just picture him Skeletor lounging on a yacht, unaware that his uh, actual congressional, his, his senatorial campaign is burning to the ground. Let's do a news roundup, Drift Glass. The Bidening continues. The Biden proposal for student debt relief has been announced. $10,000 for uh, some borrowers and $20,000 for Pell Grant recipients. Only for under uh, $125,000 individual or $250,000 household income. Uh, the aim is to cap undergraduate loan payments at 5% of monthly income. Uh, the program includes graduate school loans, parent plus loans as well. Interest is paid for as long as the loan is kept current. And the moratorium on payback is extended one last time until December 31st. A uh, reminder that Joe Biden already canceled a lot of student debt, including $3.9 billion just this month for former students of the now defunct ITT Technical Institute. This brings the total amount of loans discharged approved under President Biden to nearly $32 billion. Oklahoma Senate candidate Jaron Jackson, who says Jews will go to hell, quote unquote, uh, and a lot of other anti-Semitic horrible things to say, and was endorsed by nutcase Carrie Lake. Uh, he lost Drift Glass. He lost his primary bid. That's the good part. The not good part is that this absolutely unhinged racist lunatic won 46% of the Republican primary vote. Yup. Uh, Ron Johnson won't testify to the January 6th committee because he only plotted to overthrow the government of the United States for a couple of seconds. I had virtually no involvement. He said, literally, my involvement lasted seconds. Okay. The judge is now demanding that Trump explain why he filed a motion in her district. Trump thought but by, that by filing one county over and landing a judge he had appointed, it would work in his favor. Instead, the judge is telling Trump to get off her lawn. Herschel Walker won't debate Reverend Warnock because he said he wants to give the Georgians that Sunday to watch the NFL game, which is being played. On Thursday. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense for Herschel Walker. That's, it, it for, does. That's, that's several words strung together in a sentence. Okay. It is. It's technically a sentence, Blue Gal. It's technically a sentence. Uh, another sentence from Herschel Walker is about climate change. 
they continue to try to fool you that they are helping you out, but they're not because a lot of money is going to trees. Don't we have enough trees around here? Uh, We'd like to hat tip a Kansas listener who wrote to us a note about a tweet from a Kansas Democratic Congresswoman, Cherise Davids, saying how great it is that the IRA will be replacing lead pipes for all Kansans who now have them. Do only Democrats have lead pipes? All the Dems voted for it. All the Republicans voted against removing toxic lead pipes that kids drink from. Democrats must ask rural voters about their access to health care and clean water. Keep it local. Great advice. This week, Donald Trump decided to dress up and play lawyer. The results were hilarious. And even the judge, again, this judge he shopped for, uh, told the lawyers that showed up in court for Donald Trump that there's a form you need to fill out and I'll give you a link to it. (laughs) And and my understanding is, and then they blew it. Yeah. And they had to fill it out again. Yeah, it was bad. It was, oh God, you know, Saul Goodman somewhere is begging for this case. Mm-hmm. Um, the Mehmet Oz's campaign announced that if Fetterman ate more veggies, maybe he wouldn't have had a stroke. And That's a nice thing for a doctor to say. It's, well, you know, he's losing and he's yeah. desperate and now yeah. he's just throwing stink in every direction. This week, a furious Donald Trump told his lawyers to get my top secret documents back from the feds. Thanks for the confession, Don. Appreciate it. Uh, About those documents, the National Archives said it found more than 700 pages of classified material, some including things labeled special access program, in the 15 boxes recovered from Trump in January. And everyone's forgotten lock her up. All that stuff about classified, classified. Yeah. Voters in rural western Michigan defunded their town's only public library over books with LGBTQ content, accusing the librarians of grooming children and promoting an LGBTQ ideology. I am, I, I'm familiar with the gay agenda. I'm not familiar with the LGBTQ ideology. I'm not on that mailing list, apparently, which is... Are they aware that their children have cell phones? Their teenagers have cell phones. Are they aware that it's not 1947? I I don't know. Uh, 71% of Americans say they want to see gun laws made stricter, including about half of Republicans. Confidential election system data obtained by Trump's campaign and Sidney Powell copied and shared with election deniers, conspiracy theorists, and right-wing commentators. That's illegal. A jury convicted two men of conspiring to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer in 2020 over her COVID-19 policies. Contrary to his oath as attorney general, Bill Barr acted as Trump's personal defense attorney. He did not look at actual evidence against Trump, and then he lied about it to the public. Texas, Tennessee, and Idaho will enact abortion trigger laws this week. Starting August 25th, nearly all abortions in Tennessee will be outlawed, except in cases related to preventing the death or serious injury of a pregnant woman. The law makes no exceptions for rape or incest. Get out and vote, women. Got to do it. Louisiana state officials denied funding a New Orleans flood control project about flooding. In New Orleans. The, in New Orleans because of the city's opposition to the state's near total abortion ban. A federal court, uh, I'm sorry, a federal appeals court has said Bill Barr lied about considering charging Trump with obstruction of Mueller. Again, he just needs to go to jail. Uvalde School Board voted unanimously to fire the school police chief, Pete Arredondo. And two Florida residents just pleaded guilty in a federal court to stealing a diary and other belongings of President Biden's daughter, Ashley, and selling them to conservative group Project Veritas in the the final weeks of the 2020 election. And this is a really bad situation for Project Veritas. The two people that were... uh, just pleaded guilty in their guilty plea noted that the agency to which they sold the diary asked them to go back and steal other things. Oh, so now it's a conspiracy. Yep. It's a conspiracy to commit a crime. It's one Mm -hmm. thing. If uh, a news organization gets an item that someone got illegally and drops in their hand, It's another thing for that quote unquote news organization to say, can you go and steal anything else? That'd be great. To to solicit a crime? Yes, that would be bad. Very, very bad. 
In local news, Governor J.B. Pritzker's campaign committee has given $1.5 million to the Democratic Party of Illinois, $1 million to the Senate Democrats uh, campaign, and $3 million to the Democrats for the Illinois House. They've given zero money to Mar-a-Lago or Deutsche Bank. You know, you talk about bipartisanship, and yet you won't give money <laughs> to Mar-a-Lago or Deutsche Bank. What, yeah. what the hell, man? Uh, for some reason, Darren Bailey decided this week to attack one of J.B. Pritzker's campaign buses. For some reason, Darren Bailey decided this week to attack one of J.B. Pritzker's campaign buses for having a Tennessee license plate instead of Illinois plates, because Bailey's campaign is being run by children. Unfortunately, right under the word plate was the word apportioned which means, quote, although fleets register cars or trucks in one jurisdiction, an apportioned registration means they pay taxes and fees in each state and or province where they operate. Most importantly, their payments are proportional to the number of miles of vehicle logs in each place. So the Pritzker campaign is in fact paying taxes and fees in here in Illinois. Second, because they used a photo of the bus, what Bailey campaign actually succeeded in doing was advertising the Pritzker campaign's contact and text information in very, very big letters. So way to go, Darren Bailey. Way to go. (laughs) And there's more. When Governor Pritzker announced that he had rebuilt the Illinois Rainy Day Fund, which was virtually broke during the reign of Bruce Rauner, the notorious Illinois Policy Institute came right off the blocks, waving a report from another libertarian chop shop, Truth in Accounting, arguing that the state authorities should have used the billions in federal aid to pay down interest on existing pension debt rather than save it for a rainy day fund. Experts warned this could lead to more state borrowing. The problem, which the governor's office helpfully provided to the Illinois Policy Institute and Truth in Accounting after they'd stepped on this rake, uh, the regulations of the Treasury Department forbid funds from being used for deposits into a pension fund. Oh, no! (laughs) Also, the Illinois Policy Institute has a long history of denouncing the state for having a rainy day fund. Uh, The state has already ponied up an additional $500 million for extra pension payments on top of what the state was obligated to pay by statute. Also, when Senate President Don Harmon did ask for federal help, bailing out Illinois pension funds, the Illinois Policy Institute and others freaked out. The Helena headline from the Illinois Policy Institute was why Congress should reject Illinois' $44 billion bailout request. Yeah. See, when you have a memory and a budget. Yeah, remembering shit is, is, you know, the left remembers. It's powerful. It's powerful. Uh, Finally, uh, this brief sketch of life in Trump country was sent to us with a hat tip to listener David. It's about a band of Patriot Front Nazi scum from across the river in Missouri coming all the way to Springfield to vandalize the Phoenix Center, which is a local nonprofit doing God's work, providing housing services and education to at-risk LGBTQ plus youth in central Illinois. The story here is not the Nazi scum behaving like Nazi scum. That's never a story. It's the weary warrior soldiering on reaction of Phoenix Center Executive Director Jonna Cooley. Quote, it was really a non-issue for us. We saw it. We had it repaired. We made a police report. We went about our business. If we took the time to deal with every person that has a hateful comment or leaves a hateful message on the machine or whatever, we'd be wasting a lot of time. It's just something that's to be expected. Yep. So a bunch of twenty me... somethings from Missouri came over and spray painted ugly stuff on the door of the Phoenix Center. Yeah. And the executive director said if we took time to to address that bullshit in any other way than to just report it to the police and get on with our work, mm-hmm. we'd be wasting our time when we have lives to save. Exactly. From at risk LGBTQ plus youth. Yeah. And, and I, I find her comments to be both uh, sad and incredibly uplifting. Yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly. It's just something that we have to expect. You know, we live in a right. hateful world. We live in Trump country. This is These are the assholes who come to us all the time. And 
we're just going to keep going on. We're just going to keep and soldiering Outside on. agitators from Missouri coming yeah. over and making a mess. It, it's got a strong. to do with their lives. Yeah. It's got a strong echo of Planned Parenthood. Which just yeah, absolutely. hangs in there and hangs in there and hangs in there and never gives up because they know they're on the right side of history. Well, know that they're helping actual people. Yep. And we can all learn from that. You know, just stick with stick with your mission. That's what we're all about. Hey, each week we post to our Facebook page and website and Internet Kitty sent in by you, the listeners. This week's Internet Kitty is Hank. Hank is a 14-pound boy who was rescued from a life on the street. And Hank loves freshly poured cat food so much, he sometimes won't wait for it to actually be poured. <laughs> Hank has been caught on camera attempting to push the container of kitty treats onto the floor for the freshly poured experience. Wow. Once they learn to do that, you and I are just doomed, Blue Guy. Oh, man. Yeah. Of course, Hank does love freshly poured cat food, our fake sponsor. Whether you serve pet store perfection or dollar store dreck, your cats will sit on the kitchen floor and demand that the food they eat is only freshly poured. Freshly poured, freshly poured. Oh, my Lord, it's freshly poured. And you can visit Hank at our Facebook page or website. You can send your internet kitty dog or other pet to us at our email address, proleftpodcast at gmail.com, or you can also write to both of us. Feel free to write us. We love hearing from you. Be aware that if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service. Go, Postal Unions. Letter on the air unless you say otherwise. Hashtag Fire to Joy. And do send those postcards to voters, too. Mm -hmm. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself, buy one for us. This is not charity. This is our job, and we do not get PPP loans to meet payroll every month. <laughs> Approximately 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution, and you can too. See our website, proleftpod.com, for details. Our PayPal postal address information, Patreon, all of it is there at proleftpod.com. And we don't have advertising except for Freshly Poured, our fake sponsors. So oh, we appreciate we have a, your support. We have a lot of advertisers who have uh, gone quiet for a little while, but we'll bring in a few back. Don't worry oh, about yeah. it. Croc blockers and oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, Hello Fascist at Te home. Technically, it's a salad. Delivery. You know, Technically, so, it's a salad. So yeah. many good sponsors. So many. <laughs> please share our show on social media. And if you love this podcast, please go to our website, proleftpod.com, and send us five bucks. That's a great way to let us know you liked a specific episode. Thank you so much for doing that. Hey, Drift Glass, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Well, Blue Gal, the Internet Kitties are all in favor of student loan forgiveness as long as those students sign a binding contract to call home at least once a week. At least once a week. Let's think about living. Let's think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, loving, dubbing. Let's forget about the whine and the crying, the shooting and the dying, and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. The Professional Left Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2021 DGBG Productions.